Welcome back to How China Works. I'm Brendan Davis, and on behalf of my co-host Ying Ying Lee, we are very proud to present this episode of the show for you. Our guest this week is Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter. Dr. Richter is the chairman of Horasis. They describe themselves as a global visions community dedicated to inspiring our future. Horasis uses its unrivaled history of partnership with corporations from emerging markets to create a powerful platform for cooperation between emerging and developed markets. They host four flagship events throughout the year to bring together the key players from the economic and business and political scenes around the world. Dr. Richter is considered one of the leading analysts of international business, and he influences major business and governmental decisions with his public commentary on these matters. Prior to founding Horasis, Dr. Richter was a director of the World Economic Forum, which you may know of as the organization that puts on the event that is just commonly referred to as Davos in Davos, Switzerland. Dr. Richter is German. He currently lives in Switzerland, but he previously lived and studied and worked in Asia for about a decade, mostly in Tokyo and Beijing, where he developed and managed European multinationals' China operations specifically. Dr. Richter was very generous with his time, and it was quite an honor for Ying and I to get to spend this time with him. And our questions range very broadly, and we ask both very pragmatic and practical questions in talking about the roadmap for the future and what he's thinking about and hearing when he talks to people, as well as asking him some fairly philosophical questions about his orientation to his work and what the bigger picture is for him. So we are very proud to bring you this episode. Please enjoy this show with Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter. Welcome back to How China Works. We are here today with Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter. And uh, did I pronounce your name Absolutely, correct. properly? Yeah, Excellent. it's not an easy name. <laughs> nice. And this is, uh, this is great for us because this is Brendan Davis, and I'm here with my co-host... Ying Ying Li. Yeah, same room again. We've been yes, we both been on a world tour. I've been all over. So this is our first interview sitting with a guest again. And you travel quite a bit yourself, as I understand it. So could you briefly, for the sake of the audience, give us your introduction for yourself, your right. introduction. You're right. I travel like, um, uh, I would say, uh, most of the time. I'm almost never at home. And, you know, one of my hobbies, actually, talking about culture, is to travel to all 200 countries on Earth. Now I'm at number 163. Wow. Uh, but now the difficult countries are missing. But, uh, you know, those things beside what we do, I founded Horasis um, 15 years ago, and I used to be a director of the World Economic Forum of Davos, and we host large scale summits for CEOs. Right. We host five summits per year, including one on China. And that's what's brought me here, actually, this uh, day. So we, um, I attend here the Bill Bell and Road Summit with mm-hmm. President Xi Jinping tomorrow. Fantastic. So I think in terms of background, could you? How did you come to your work? How did this? How did this become something that interested you? And and what was kind of the the the, the short version of your, right. of your journey? Right. I always want to connect people and to make uh, the world a better place to live on. And uh, what we do is to shape the future and to inspire the future. That's our vision. And um, so we bring people from different backgrounds, from different countries, from different industries together, basically uh, from business, government, and civil society. And um, the China meeting is actually how we started 15 years ago. Uh, The meeting is always held outside China, which Mm -hmm. is quite interesting. The Chinese CEOs travel to a given country to meet their global counterparts. And um, of course, um, they learn about uh, investment, uh, venture capital, private equity, but also about culture, how Mm -hmm. to deal with a given country, how to, um, uh, in a way, accept also uh, uh, global best practices, Mm -hmm. and um, also to um, engage with uh, the leadership of uh, this country. So how did this idea come to you that you host this kind of China meeting outside of China? Yeah. Right. You know, it's kind of contrarian. People always say we should do a China meeting in China, but there's so many meetings here. And uh, <laughs> right. I tell you, it's sometimes easier to get a Chinese high-level CEO to a different country. This year's meeting will be held in Las Vegas, and I hope and I see and I feel that uh, many Chinese CEOs will attend this meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's if we would do a meeting here in Beijing, they would just appear for an hour to speak and disappear. But once they're with us, they stay the whole time, and they're approachable, they interact, and, uh, you know, they they're try to make new friends. So I have a follow-up question with that um, before we actually move on. 
What was the most impressive story that you have heard or you have experienced during these like fifteen years of hosting this kind of event? And did you see any kind of changes、uh, starting when you just started this、uh, whole you know China meetings outside of China and do now? Like what what has changed? And when it comes to the topics and、right. people's focus, you know, in the beginning, actually, it was quite difficult to get、um, a Chinese CEO on a panel, and even so, with Chinese translation,、um, uh, it was not easy, you know, to get them speak and to interact and to, you know, in a way, have this Western way of communication.、Mm-hmm. Uh, now, actually, it's almost the contrary. You know, there are so many very good Chinese speakers. Uh, you know, even you know, with a portion of humor, and、um, you know, they're choking on the panel, and,、uh, and now actually, you know, the pendulum is swinging back. You know, it's quite easy to find good Chinese speakers. You've been one of them, Inging, last time. I was going to brag、exactly. on her, but I didn't want to interrupt you.、Uh, and, and sometimes I feel that you know, some of our、uh, European American friends, right, are kind of boring in comparison. <laughs>、uh, that's one, you know, observation. But、uh, beside the China meeting, we host also a global meeting, which is the whole world. And there was one very touching moment last year where the session. On Nelson Mandela, and、uh, on his one、uh, hundredth birthday, and、uh, with actually one of his inmates on Rotten Island、um, joining us、um, at this meeting, and it was all about、um, principles,、uh, about leadership, and、uh, I think a lot of people really had tears、uh, in their eyes after the session. So we would like to also generate those emotional moments that people can really, you know, sit back and say, you know, what does it mean for my life? What are the lessons to be learned? What is the derivation of the name of your organization? Horasis is ancient Greek. It means long-term visions, and of course, you need a name for a company. And the good thing is,、uh, people are usually asking what it means. But show、uh, beside,、um, uh, we are very much into the visions business. So we would like to provide long-term visions. And I believe that、um, our world today, and、um, talking about Anglo-Saxon capitalism, is very much.、Um, Um, in a way, dominated by uh, uh, short-term action, it's all about、uh, you know pushing up the share price.、Mm-hmm. But a lot of CEOs don't really have the long-term vision. Even politicians in the Western world, you know, there's this four years election circle, and you know the first year in power,、uh, not much is changing because they have to adapt and to learn. Maybe end of the second year, there's some changes, and from the third year, they focus again on re-election. I like the Chinese model. I have to say,、uh, of course, a totally different model of governance and political governance, but it's a very long-term view. Exactly. This is something that、um, I've I've learned a lot of from doing the show and with Inging with the previous season discussing the long-range, long-term thinking with China. And I'm wondering what what have been some of the other challenges, just process challenges, with kind of bringing China into this more Western-oriented conversation. You know, one challenge definitely is,、um, you know, say what should be on the agenda. Of course, we are not so much focusing on、uh, geopolitics. We try to avoid it.、Um, this year in Las Vegas, we will definitely have a session on tariffs. So, of course,、mm. being U.S., we have to talk about U.S.-China trade war. But it's not, let's say, the the main topic. We have、mm. actually sessions on innovation and how American and Chinese CEOs can join hands. And、uh, try、That's、to develop a very important、uh, topic. Exactly, and join technologies and learn from each other. If you go to the Silicon Valley these days, you know many of the innovators actually are Chinese. I was just, I just, I just spent about a month in Palo Alto with my one of my my partner on my current film project is、right. based in Palo Alto. Yeah, and yeah.、Um, we're surrounded. I, my daily walk was by Steve Jobs' house. Oh, <laughs> so okay, I was, I was surrounded by it. And what's funny is that my first trip there back in the fall. My where I was staying in an Airbnb, and I looked out my window the first morning, and the Tencent office,、uh-huh, right, <laughs> exactly, Silicon Valley exactly. is right across the way, yeah, and and I, and so many of the Chinese companies have their office like right、Absolutely. off of Sand Hill Road or something that's a very prominent location. So we're intertwined together already. Like in, in Chinese, we say "ni zhong you wo, wo zhong you ni." Basically,、mm. I'm in you, and you're in me. Part of like this. So、yes. this is at least from what I see、um, globally for and even with. Trade for I think you know、um, U.S. China relationship has to go on you know and, and despite all the political stuff behind which is also again very short term oriented I think we have to find a solution and we have to start with business I think business is really the change maker in society and not so much the political dimension. Well, we're both excited to get into a lot of specifics with you, but let's first ask you to give a bit of a framework of your current. 
uh, mission, shall we say? You know, what, what you, you, you mentioned the event in Vegas and sort of what's on the agenda at a high level, but what are the action items? What are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? Right. So the event in uh, Vegas uh, could really, you know, uh, uh, an event for, uh, you know, big changes, I hope. We will also invite politicians from D.C. and from uh, Beijing. Our partner is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, the Sands Company. The event will be held uh, at the Venetian Hotel. And, um, you know, with this event, uh, maybe, you know, we are moving back to normal when it comes to U.S.-China relationship because we have the the human dimension, you know, when, when American and Chinese CEOs um, come together. And I think for better understanding, maybe some even deals happening. Um, we are trying to invite uh, technology companies from China, despite mm -hmm. the whole uh, Huawei issue. And, uh, you know, companies like Tencent, Baidu uh, are on our list. And I think they will come. Um, and I think it's, it's really a golden opportunity to, to bring both countries uh, again together. Let me ask a question that uh, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm putting on my tinfoil hat for a second. But for the sake of people who are not living in your world, Davos is often used as a four-letter word among certain people who don't understand the mission. Could you, for the sake of, of, of giving us context to build on, what does it mean to you? What is the purpose of the World Economic Forum? And what are the, the steps to making it actually uh, slightly de you know, more demystified, I think, for the average person who is only very per <laughs> peripherally like, what are all those people doing as they're making their plans? Right. <laughs> you know, meanwhile, the agenda is published and there's cameras. But yes, what's what what are what what is Davos uh, ideally in your mind? You know, I used to work for the World Economic Forum. Of course, I have my own personal view, and um, some people now start to compare us with Davos, saying we are like um, Davos. Um, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Other people say we are like uh, Davos for emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Even uh, a third group is saying we are like a Davos for nice people. <laughs> uh, because, you know, in Davos, we have so many uh, so-called uh, fat cats. Of course, you know, uh, uh, just giant so besides. Corporation. Exactly. Right. Giant corporation, you know, politicians. Mm -hmm. President Trump actually attended Davos last year. And people are always think, you know, people, you know, delegates go to Davos. And it's a bit of kind of um, an agenda behind, like even like a secret agenda to govern the world. World, which like, is not like, the case. like it's the Bilderberg meetings. Or exactly, something. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> which is really not the case. I think it's just a, a very good event, maybe the best event in the world. Uh, but we are not benchmarking ourselves. Um, so we are maybe a bit more practical. Mm -hmm. um, we are not, let's say, on the level saying that we have to, you know, put forward new philosophies on a very high level, but we are more practical. Okay. And you see, if you can change just little things, it's already like a big win. Right. Yeah. So with that being said, Interestingly, I had a direct uh, feeling when it comes to, you know, you just mentioned about this uh, secret and those, because right now, um, general public get information from the transparent media or from their own media channels. They want to see how the world is shaped and uh, they have a lot of people start to feel like, um, why should I trust and how should I trust and how could I get also involved in this particular meeting or, or initiative um, had the potential to actually bring more people actually from more diverse background, not just, uh, of course, uh, from the top intellectuals, but any other from the pragma uh, practical or pragmatic mm. way to bring, you just mentioned maybe, uh, li like last time, I, you mentioned interesting people, right? So what are actually those people could actually become the pillars of the event that you are interested in looking for? You know, um, uh, a lot of um, observers say that the so-called Bretton Woods institutions are in crisis you know, IMF, World Bank, even the UN. And uh, maybe there are, you know, there are old institutions and uh, there should be reformed, I guess, maybe streamlined as well. Um, but uh, what's really happening is that um, those institutions were found um, 60, 70 years ago, basically after the war. And I believe we would need new institutions where um, 
governments and business and civil society can work together. And uh, the WF, World Economic Forum, is doing that. We are doing that. And um, I think we need more of those kind of institutions. People say maybe we are even like a new Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay. we are very okay. informal, right? Um, but uh, we have a community. People come every year again. So I would say 80% of participants um, always come. I've even some people who come to f all four of our meetings per year. Mm -hmm. So they travel with me around the world. <laughs> wow. Uh, and um, on, you know, with these communities, there are also initiatives coming up. Um, at our last um, Horasis Global Meeting, we had uh, the president of Sierra Leone attending, a small Western African country, and uh, he proposed um, an African um, peace initiative, where basically uh, the budget for the army, I think um, he proposed that 10% of the budget it's put into peace initiatives. Hmm. And uh, now um, we start to talk to other African leaders, and this hmm. idea was born at Horasis. Hmm. And uh, those are just an example, you know, how a private public partnership could work. So, in terms of the framework for what you're actually working on, can you give us this overview and then we will kind of drill down into some detail? Right, so we um, host four large-scale summits every year. So we do um, China, India, Southeast Asia, and uh, a global meeting. And uh, it's a true um, private-public partnership. It's always um, a country inviting us. We work with a government, but we change the government, so not to be uh, dependent on just one government. Mm -hmm. uh, and independence is extremely important. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are Swiss-based, so we are neutral mm -hmm. anyway, and we avoid any political opinion. Of course, we have opinions on um, on the economy and uh, where the world is moving, but uh, we say we wouldn't kind of, you know, favor, let's say, you know, the left or the right uh, but we're just maybe in the center, but we don't have our own opinion. Uh, but, you know, the real stars are really our participants, the de delegates we are inviting. So we invite uh, entrepreneurs, but also CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, large Chinese state-owned companies. Uh, we invite Ming Chi, uh, private companies. It's really a mix, and we believe that it's mix can generate what I call um, the wisdom of the crowd because of many different opinions. Right. How diverse it is um, of this kind of group when it comes to all participants coming together to this event. You also mentioned this has been like 15 years, Yeah. right? So 15 years ago, people get information maybe from broadcasting and TV or newspaper. Right now, everybody get information or kind of have formed the world view from different kind of media, digital media. Right. So when it comes to digitalization, a new era of globalization right now with a lot of people going global and, you know, you know, going to this particular stage, how much percentage are from the new generation um, who actually have um, a, a way to show okay, right. their opinion because generally speaking, the well, com well accomplished people are relatively in that kind of generation because you kind of have to build everything up, right? And from the um, from time, but right now with uh, younger people staying on social media and following the world news every day, and they kind of have their opinion to show. Um, how much this is valued from what I see, like how important mm. it is to hear their opinions, like uh, from that um, different generations, at least. Good question, Ying. And um, first of all, I have to say that information and knowledge is not the same. And why are people coming to our event? You know, you can read. Uh, news, of course, you know, uh, digitally every morning, and you have, you know, you just go on on, on the web. Um, but uh, what's really counting is knowledge, and uh, people coming to our event uh, all come for the learning experience, learning from each other. And usually, you know, those are not things uh, public on on the web. It's all brand new. It's all like you know, personal, you know, um, uh, experience. And uh, uh, that's really, you know, the reason why people come. And we always hoped um, that everybody goes back with one life changing idea. Year, which could maybe lead him to a new business. And, and that's what we want to achieve. On, on diversity, uh, at our global meeting now, we are approaching 50% female participants. Wow. We make a very special effort. Uh, the China meeting is less, but uh, we are trying hard. You know, a lot of CEOs of state-owned companies are still male, but uh, a lot of um, uh, young female entrepreneurs, and we, we try to invite them. Um, a lot of young people as well. Uh, you have seen maybe at the last uh, Horace's China meeting, a lot of um, startup entrepreneurs as well, both from China and the world. And I think this, again, this mix is extremely important also in terms of reverse mentoring, mm. because the elder CEO maybe might learn from, from the young people. 
exactly this is what I say when I really share with my people, like my peers in this generation, is generational diversity intelligence. When you could interact with people from different generation and form consensus and collaborate together, I mean, there's huge potential to be unleashed. Yes, and then you know, also you know, people from different countries. Uh, yes. For example, there was an opening plenary, our global meeting two weeks ago, with um, a royal attending, uh, the uh, the princess from Norway, basically the daughter of the king, and uh, she was just amazing. And at the same session, we had a president, the head of state from an African country, from Namibia. And then we had actually uh, a minister from Kosovo, wow. uh, which is a small country, which is not recognized by many other countries. So it was a very interesting mix. And, uh, you know, again, diversity. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end, you know, all three panelists agreed on the future, saying we know, need more empathy. Especially the princess said, you know, we have to reconnect to Mother Earth and uh, avoid, uh, you know, greed. Because greed, in a way, is driving us. And greed is behind, I think, um, wars, uh, yeah. corruption, and any kind of ethical misbehavior. Well, this, this opens up a pretty interesting can of worms related to what I was thinking about heading over here, which is building on what Inging said about the importance of diversity of all kinds, as you were just addressing, to get all these voices in the room and to form some sort of a consensus. How do you get to a consensus with something real specifically like monetary policy and how the world should cooperate. How do you, how do you get to like a New Breton right. or something like that with so many voices in the room? Right. It's in a way um, difficult because you have so many voices. Um, you know, at our last meeting, we had 800 participants uh, from different countries. And of course, uh, not everybody agrees on, on, on everything. But um, we have the so-called co-chairs. The co-chairs are the eminent leaders that speak on the main panels and their task is also to summarize the results, to find consensus. So it's like small working groups where the co-chairs meet and kind of feedback from the different sessions they attend. And uh, we had a final plenary and uh, we um, declared at the end, um, uh, you know, the, the consensus and, and uh, the vision for the future. And the idea was to say we have to give up on populism nationalism and protectionism and uh, i believe that you know those um, three uh, developments are very much behind this new machiavellian mindset you know machiavelli the italian philosopher who really well, says yeah. you know the end justifies the means mm -hmm. and um, i think that's really happening right now you know we have uh, uh, you know an america first um, doctrine and i think uh, this doctrine is now copied by many other countries uh, saying, you know, we have to create maybe like a new Chinese wall around our country. We have to kind of stop uh, imports. We have to work on kind of, you know, trade deficits. Mm. And there's even a kind of cultural war. You see that, you right. know, we have to kind of impose our culture on others. Mm. You think about Europe, you know, what's happening there um, on the migration front with many migrants coming from Northern Africa. And um, uh, we see the rise of populist parties, maybe also the reason behind Brexit, Right. And, uh, you know, Brexit was basically a vote uh, against foreigners. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we see um, movements in Italy. Italy is now led by a very populist government from the extreme right and extreme left mm -hmm. together. The yeah. same in Greece and uh, in France with a very uh, populist party. And even in Germany, um, uh, you have a populist party rising. Um, they have around um, 15 to 20 percent in the uh, recent polls. So wow. it's really scary. Yeah, that didn't work out so well last time for Germany. Exactly. And then, you know, just, you know, I hope that history is not repeating itself in Europe. And we have election very soon and, mm -hmm. you know, a big session on Europe saying, you know, how can Europe really come together and have to, you know, reform the institutions in Brussels? Well, and the, the fear of the other is never going to go away. It's been with us since, as far as we can tell, time immemorial. But somehow we have to find ways to cooperate. And you mentioned some of the things, especially coming together on environmental issues that affect us globally. It seems like one avenue to do it. What are some of the other ways that you are attempting to actually find common ground? What are some of the other major topic areas? You know, um, you're right. Um, it's a fear of the other. And um, yeah, there's another philosopher, uh, Thomas Hobbes, um, based or, you know, he lived in the UK. And he was basically saying in Latin, homo homini lupus, man is man's wolf. 
And uh, maybe it's kind of um, in our DNA, I don't know, but um, I believe that, you know, we are basically born as good people and only the environment um, is kind of changing us and, and the greed is coming in. Uh, but um, what I really would like to call for is an open world, a world where people and nations can collaborate and we have to strengthen multilateral institutions. And maybe we see now a void of leadership. I can't really see strong leaders around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in Europe, you know, um, we had a strong leader with Angela Merkel. Uh, she's on her way out. Uh, Macron was a big hope. But uh, Macron um, is now facing the Yellow West movement and yes. there's definitely a crisis of the middle class. Yeah. Um, and uh, Macron, um, I think he's fighting for his political survival. Right. And um, so uh, the hope is gone that he might lead Europe. Um, and uh, the same in other countries, right? We don't really have true leaders anymore and, and the world is really on the edge. And um, uh, it's a world a bit out of order. So when it comes to new form of leadership, it's kind of like a, a burning and really emerging, emerging critical um, item right now for us to think about. What are the essentials uh, for forming the new type of leadership? What are the key ingredients, like in your mind, that are very, very, very critical here to to form this kind of new type of leadership? That is you know, ideal? yes, uh, I think we have to start to groom leaders. And, uh, you know, a country doing it actually is China. You know, China is using the model that, you know, always the best is going like uh, to the next step. It's maybe the old Confucian principle of Confucianism. And um, we are not really doing it in, in the West. And, and sometimes, you know, a populist uh, party is coming in and just grabbing power. But we are not grooming the best. And I think uh, maybe we have the most powerful leadership, but not the best people. So maybe starting with early education, you know, like mm. in kindergarten, uh, where we um, mm. teach the kids to kind of give up on greed and to be friendly to each other, maybe a new form of altruism, what I would call weak altruism. Of course, you can't be a full altruist, otherwise mm. you would die yeah. because right. you give away, you know, your right. clothes in winter. But um, weak altruism means that you always think that, you know, uh, you give, you know, most things you have to the other people. And on the long term, actually, you will have also benefit because the environment is growing and uh, the environment, you know, is, is giving back to you. And it's a bit my own philosophy saying that we need weak altruism mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, we abandon our kind of personal greed and our personal ambitions. Well, and and I don't want to play devil's advocate for the sake of that, because that's I, I, I subscribe to your philosophy in terms of thinking that's the way we should be in the world. And I would hope more people would be. But you see China struggling with a lot of things. One thing that they struggle with, and it affects my, you know, my industry of entertainment, in, and which is more broadly in the culture industry, of course, because everyone knows that soft power in China has these lofty soft power ambitions, yet they are very bad at it, frankly, as anyone would tell you who's working within the system. And you can't legislate someone to think that your culture is, is cool or to make it translate and transfer. It has to have some intrinsic value to the person receiving it. So when that doesn't work, there's a tendency to fall back to hard power because people know how to do hard power. How do you reconcile that 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 tendency? It's this really it's it's I guess it's a dialectic of these two two forces, but I love the idea of intrinsically you know, the the proper kind of altruism. But what is, if, if that's the carrot, what's the stick <laughs> that's going to make people behave? I mean, how, do we, how do we find this middle ground here? Right. Yeah. You know, talking about middle ground, I think what we really need in our nowadays life is a middle ground to yeah. avoid the extreme. Uh, to the left, to the right, you know, to the north, to the south, just to the right thing in the middle and have like principled leadership. Talking about China and soft power, uh, you know, the, the country leading in terms of soft power is the US. If you think about, you know, Hollywood, if you think about music, uh, it's, I would say, globally 70 to 80% American. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big gap to the next countries. Uh, China is trying. Um, there have been a lot of uh, actually Hollywood uh, productions recently with Chinese elements. Like Crazy Rich. Uh, Exactly. I, I, That's actually I'm, quite a bad example. I'm, but uh, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm in the process of producing one right now with, with minor, with small Chinese elements. Right, right. And I think that's maybe a way uh, to go ahead that, you know, I think there's more and more interest in Chinese culture. And, you know, I love, for example, the, the older movies of Chang Yi Mo. But sure. uh, mm. it's a minority. You know, it's not like, you know, for the mainstream, obviously. Yeah. But uh, once, you know, China is uh, producing... 
Yeah, like which element of Zhang Yimou's film that you like most? Because <laughs> I engage with a lot of Westerner friends. They love Zhang Yimou's uh, movie, you know, for right. some reason. I, I want to understand what are the most yeah, because sometimes for you guys. Sometimes, I mean, he his films tend to be sort of among the most uh, <laughs> professional, like the most well done and satisfying right. on an artistic and technical and creative level. Uh -huh. But the stories behind it, I think are, are because, what because you're asking here about. I would, I why, do, why want, do they resonate on Because I, what I truly want to understand is what resonated most and why it resonated. It, because I have my own assumption on it. Yes. You know, I like actually his older movies, the new movies with a lot of, you know, kung fu elements. And it's more like a bit of a mainstream thing. But, you know, his earlier movies mm -hmm. had all, even like a political dimension. Mm -hmm. It's about history, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, the uh, cultural revolution, you know, then showing like a family uh, and, and all kind of the ups and downs. And um, even like, um, you know, um, not so much a comedy, but more like tragedies, mm. uh, also reflecting a bit human mankind from human a Chinese, side. yeah, the mm. human side. And that's what I like. You know, of course, there are also love stories involved, mm -hmm. uh, but all weaved in with history. And for me, you know, I could watch those movies just for hours, right, one yeah. after the other. And uh, I think uh, that's where China should go mm. and show really the true elements. And Chinese culture is very deep. And it's definitely different from the mainstream Western essence. And, uh, you know, we always think it's just like, you know, a Kung Fu story, but the Chinese culture is very deep. So you brought us one particular word, keyword, I think is very important. In our show, we put that, you know, push that in front a lot of times, history. Mm -hmm. When it comes to understand a country's whole background and where, um, what is past and now and future, we got to understand, go back to understand the history and the civilization behind it. So now my question is for generally your people, like the people are not Chinese that you engage with, generally speaking, um, how much, like what, what is the percentage that as far as you know, like when it comes to understanding China, they put history in their knowledge, in their understanding or in their interest, in their curiosity? Right. You know, um, of course, the percentage is increasing, but it's still very small. I think most people in the West don't really um, understand or never learn about Chinese culture, you know, the different dynasties and, and uh, even like, you know, the, the philosophies behind. And it's not only, of course, Confucianism, but, you know, uh, you know, Taoism and, and everything. And of course, like Buddhism, how it started in China. Um, and um, I think um, we should maybe um, rewrite our textbooks for the young kids, have maybe longer chapters on China. You know, if you read like an American American textbook. It's all about you know American independence and so on. Like a bit of European history sure, and sure. China history is usually in one page, right? Uh, interesting enough, the Chinese study Western culture. They know a lot. I'm always amazed, you know, how much they know. You know, the educated people. Uh, those uh, you know who went to university, they know everything. They even know where Switzerland is based. You know, a wow. small country <laughs> where I'm uh, living in, and uh, it, it's quite amazing. Talking about um, culture and uh, globalization, maybe I should make a point that um, globalization doesn't mean that we all have to eat the same food and have the same thinking. I think we always need the local in the global. And uh, that's extremely important, you know, saying that uh, even so, you know, we travel around the world, we still are distinctive and we can enjoy our own roots. Mm. And, you know, I travel a lot, but when I come back to my small village, I just like to be there and, and you know, have a little walk in the vineyards and uh, see the mountains and say, you know, that's, that's home, right? Mm. right? I think we need both. And um, it starts also with actually a session at our next uh, Horasis meeting uh, on cultural sensitivities, which start in a way with greetings. You know, how do you greet each other? <laughs> in southern Italy, you give like uh, uh, three kisses, in France, even four. Uh -huh. um, then, uh, you know, the chat Japanese, uh, the Boeing, mm -hmm. and it's always interesting when different cultures meet in this first thing. And I you know I've seen funny things that mm -hmm. suddenly the Japanese start to kiss and what the, is the Italian starts to bow, right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, it's always a very interesting moment, but it's a moment of joy, and you right. see that culture can be so diverse. That's amazing. So you have a little bit background related to Silk Road, right? Um, I assume that you studied either um, about Silk Road and part of that history, or you have been there. I, I think when I was doing some reading about you, you know, there's some keywords pop up. Can you elaborate yes. on that? Yes. You know, as a young boy, um, I lived in Japan uh, for my PhD studies, and uh, I didn't want to go back and uh, go to work. And I said, you know, let's spend... Uh, 
half a year on a ten dollar basis per day, and I travel to many countries on the Silk Road, and uh, I spend a few months in China, and um, uh, so I discovered uh, the Tatlamakan Desert. So I was riding on camels, donkeys, walking, uh, old buses, um, and it was a great experience. And then I um, uh, went to the um, Karakoram Highway uh, to Pakistan. And uh, so I've seen, in a way, you know, how the Silk Road works and, you know, the different cultures kind of uh, merging. I've seen at the time, actually, some very old caves in China on the Silk Road, and there were still people living in. Mm. Uh, totally um, unusual, because, you know, when the uh, usual foreigner comes to Shanghai, he goes to the uh, Grand Hyatt Hotel and says, you know, that's China, right? But China is so diverse, you know, we have people still living in caves, and uh, almost like, you know, 2,000 years ago. And uh, that's really the richness of uh, the Silk Road. But um, I'm also very much into the new Silk Road, mm -hmm. One Bell Run Road. I'm attending here a summit, which is, of course, more like an uh, economic agenda. People talk about the new Marshall Plan and, you know, where China connects with Central Asia and, and Europe and, and partly also with Africa. There's even like an Arctic route now to the north. So I think China is now more and more uh, trying to be a good global citizen, talking about soft power again, and, and trying to complement um, the Western framework of collaboration. How do you see this playing out? I mean, of course, there's you know, a lot of, lot, of, lot of moving parts to this, but how do you see the next, like the near term of China's ascendancy on the world stage? And of course, there is the wild card, as you said, the populist movements, and uh, we don't get political, but uh, unfortunately, what's happening in my country, I'll say that. Um, but but given the givens and given that we have so many variables in an ideal world, how would you how would you suggest people should approach this, this dealing with China, respecting mm. China, what Inging mentioned, and, and learning about the culture? How, how do how do how do we do this collectively? Right. You know, I see that um, uh, there's definitely a wild card, a uh, friction, or even a, a war, um, a trade war, um, which could become even worse. Uh, because what we see right now is that the um, world superpower, the U.S., is um, slightly declining, and a new superpower is rising, and it's kind of a period, what I call an interregnum, you know, something in between. We are in a limbo. It's still not clear who is taking over. And we've seen this before, you know, uh, the UK was basically the power of the past and suddenly the US came up and then Germany was a challenger. There's always a challenger. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, there might be a clash between the incumbent uh, power and, and the challenger. And uh, talking about the trade war, um, there might be actually uh, some announcements pretty soon. People say maybe uh, as soon as next week, where the U.S. and Chinese government uh, sign a deal. I'm uh, pessimistic, I have to say. And um, after uh, President Trump, you know, uh, got the, the clearance um, after the Mueller report, I think he's now um, putting his attention again on China. And I don't think there will be a deal um, on the midterm. And this whole thing is tracking on. And eventually... Uh, there might be uh, really the 200 billion US dollar tariffs coming up, uh, you know, on imports, which I believe could really lead to a new global economic crisis uh, and maybe a double whammy combined with Brexit. Um, and uh, already now, you know, the world is showing signs of um, uh, deceleration and uh, some countries already in technical recession like Italy. Uh, Turkey, definitely, uh, as emerging markets, uh, even like Brazil and uh, South Africa is not in a good shape, talking about the BRICS. And uh, even Germany, which is the European powerhouse, uh, just revised um, his growth figures by half to around 1%. Well, you mentioned interregnum, and of course, that's an analogy in a different dimension. For uh, purgatory is another phrase that comes to mind for me. We're in this in between place where we don't know where things are going exactly. Um, if you could indulge my, you know, the, the people who who spend time chasing the the the, the worst case scenarios, and perhaps you know, we can put some of that to rest. What do you think the worst case outcome? Of the current the current situation, the current balls in the air as things land, what what does what does bad look like to you in the next couple of years? And then let's focus on the good, of course. Right. You know, I, I don't want to be called uh, Mr. Doom, who just uh, <laughs> looks <laughs> around. Well, 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 I, I yeah. to, well, well but, but yeah, a few, few people with the understanding that you are coming from an opposite orientation to this, you can only do that if you understand 
the other yeah, side as yeah, well. So I'm right. curious. I'm curious. Someone Absolutely. with your knowledge would would really right. be able to shed some light on Maybe, this. Maybe um, uh, talk about the wild card and you know the doom uh, kind of doom scenario. I mean, short of you know, right. well, short of war. I mean, we understand exactly. nuclear exactly. apocalypse is like that's the worst. Right. Thing, the worst. Right. But right. Short of that, what does bad look like? Yeah. You know, I feel that um, we might uh, go into a global economic crisis by the fourth quarter this year already, which is quite frightening, or the first quarter next year. And I believe the um, next crisis will be much worse than the crisis of 2008 uh, for two reasons. The first reason is that with the rise of populism, we talked about it before, there's no longer any incentive to collaborate globally. And, um, you know, it's like a dog eat dog mentality. Uh, and uh, 2008, actually, all nations came together, you know, like central banks collaborated, but it's not happening now in, in case, you know, we have this crisis. Even central banks at the time, you know, lowered interest rates. Now you can't really lower interest rates because we're at zero. There's no really arsenal to fight an economic crisis. So it's one point. The second point is why I believe the crisis might be much worse is China. China, um, I'm cautiously optimistic, you know, about the economy, but if the trade war really comes in, China might lose 2% of GDP uh, immediately. And China is no longer decoupled. 2008, there was a so-called decoupling of the Chinese economy because China was still not very integrated in the global economy. Now it is. You know, the whole supply chains globally start in China and end in China. Right. And uh, so I think China will definitely feel the headwinds. So from an economic point of view, um, uh, a severe economic crisis, eventually leading to something much worse. Sure. Uh, why I'm telling you that? We see in the Western world mm. a crisis of the middle class. Uh, you know, the middle class is shrinking in the US, but also in Europe, leading to populism again. Right. And uh, people go to the street. It's actually the reason behind the Yellow West movement in France. So just imagine we go into an economic crisis, and what will happen to the middle class? A lot of people will lose jobs, unemployment. They might go to the street. And there's automation and AI, you know, exactly. this, which are happening anyway. Yes. And how do we integrate that? So people um, talk about the fourth industrial revolution, saying this uh, rise of AI and blockchain the world will be much better. World. I am much more pessimistic. Mm. I believe that uh, AI really is um, changing everything dramatically. Think about the, um, the truck drivers in the US. You know, with self-driving cars, suddenly you know hundreds of thousands of people will lose their jobs. Think even about a lawyer. You know, AI actually can replace the uh, work of lawyers because you know uh, an AI agent is so intelligent, right? That you don't really need need uh, PhDs anymore, right, in, in, in law. So right. do you believe that, because AI is doing self-learning very, very quickly, when AI development is passing a line, the human, a yeah. majority of humans or jobs are going to become irrelevant? Or it's kind of like there will be a line, a, a turning point? Uh, it'll be a turning point, and I think um, uh, we will lose employment on both ends. You know, the uneducated people, right? Uh, let's say the, the truck drivers, but then also the very educated people, mm -hmm. and then everybody in the middle. I think everybody will be affected, and I'm not sure what we should tell our kids to learn, right? right. What should I study in this world of change? And uh, I believe, coming back to the shrinking middle class, that we won't see uh, an industri the fourth industrial revolution, but maybe a fourth political revolution. You know, after the French Revolution, and you see you know, how it ended with the guillotine, um, sure. uh, the French king, we've seen then the Russian Revolution, and then again the fall of the Soviet Empire. Maybe we will enter a fourth revolution. Again, I'm Mr. Doom. Sure. But, well, no, uh, but, but, yeah. how, but how, well, well, how does that look to you? I mean, and again, worst case, dystopian nightmare that wakes right. you up. What what does that look like when you look at the paper that day? Uh, you know, uh, there's a famous um, novel. I think I talked about it at my talk at Tsinghua um, by um, Michel Hollybeck, uh, a French novelist. And he says, you know, in the French, uh, next French presidential election, in the second round, there will be a very populist party and will be the Muslim Brotherhood. And you have choice, you know, uh, you know, uh, in between, seeing those two options, and that's maybe what Europe is facing, you know, extremes. Right. And Europe is really like an interesting laboratory for the future, <laughs> and uh, these things might happen in other countries as well. Um, so, just in short, um, could be a new kind of revolution happening, um, you know, because uh, you know, global, there's globalization and its discontent, and middle class is shrinking, and then finally a clash between China 
and US. And I think Russia is out here. Uh, Russia, of course, uh, is always a threat, if you wish. But I think the real kind of um, thing happening in the future is the US-China thing. Well, I'm going to mention someone, and I hope you don't throw me out of your apartment, because I know he's very discredited in many mainstream circles, but the controversial economist Martin Armstrong has his Armstrong model predicting certain types of changes in upheaval. And I have a friend who's kind of a, a geek about that. And he's been telling me, I told you so, I told you so. All these things happening are strangely lining up with this fairly dystopian reality where it looks according to his projections and watching these societal things, it looks like it's about eight to 10 years of no fun. And yeah. then, and then basically things get so bad with some kind of another like world war of some kind. And then there's the rebuilding, which is our opportunity to rise from the ashes. Hopefully we don't get there. I hope that I hope my friend and those people are wrong. Yeah. So on a more positive note, because, because you're not Mr. Doom, you're, you're, you're not Dr. Doom, you're sunshine. Yeah. You're Mr. Sunshine. Yeah. How do we how do we collectively and how does China specifically, since the show is called How China Works, let's get your insights about China. How can China and China watchers and friends and allies help to avoid that worst case scenario? What can China do right. to lead with lead with love sounds pretty corny. I'm going to regret saying that, but I'll say it. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of uh, black swan scenarios and, of course, even black elephant scenarios <laughs> uh, of what could happen. And, you know, you're right, uh, 10 years, it's quite a good time frame. Um, people say that, you know, the, the cycle of crisis is getting shorter and uh, it might happen every 10 years. So just looking back, the last one started 2008 and the new one might start very soon and might be, you know, leading to a kind of war or at least like a clash clash of civilizations. And uh, maybe that's like a, a blessing in disguise, I say, you know, out of the ashes. But I think we should avoid this in any case. And uh, Let's and try, try not it. to burn anything in the process. Exactly. You know, right. I think we have to avoid it and then say, you know, we have to find a consensus. And, you know, I have to applaud here the Chinese leadership because um, when the um, trade war started, right, everybody was thinking that the Chinese government would kind of fight forcefully against mm -hmm. America. But so far, the reaction was very soft. And I think it was very wise uh, by the Chinese and just wait and go for compromise. And a lot of things actually are changing mm -hmm. when it comes to um, IP protection, intellectual property, when it comes to investment framework, mm -hmm. when it comes to even subsidies. Um, and uh, I think China is ready to go to the negotiation table. And uh, maybe they should do more and also taking more uh, responsibility in, in global institutions and, and uh, say, you know, maybe uh, a future head of the World Bank or the IMF could be Chinese. So far, it's always an American leading World Bank and a European leading IMF. So I think China needs also his place in the world. And maybe the West should actively invite China and, you know, uh, embrace China. Do you see that um, other tendencies or kind of like a willingness from the China side are right now in terms of events, in terms of uh, um, activity-wise that more Chinese participants in those organizations you said in taking actively taking that role? You know, we had um, Chinese um, heads of um, international organizations already. The current head of the ITU, that's the International uh, Telecom Union, is a Chinese. For many years, uh, a Chinese was leading the WHO. Mm -hmm. So on the um, specialized UN agencies, we got already some names. Also, um, the deputy of the of Christine Lagarde um, mm -hmm. for the last few years was a Chinese, Mr. Chu Min. Um, but uh, I think we can see we should see more. Um, and uh, the West shouldn't be afraid. I think um, we have to engage China, and the best way is is to abundance, you know, certain um, things we held in the past and to actively invite the Chinese. Well, I, you mentioned that you did your PhD studies in Japan. And so when I, for instance, was was going through high school and entering college in the 80s, Japan was was on the ascendancy. And everyone thought it was going to be Japan's century. Or that would, I, everyone didn't think that was what was being promoted and pushed. And then, of course, it's it's worked out a bit differently. And without getting off on a tangent, because I don't know enough about Japan uh, on that level to even have a coherent discussion, other than to say, what are some lessons China could learn from Japan and from its other neighbors who have been faced with this opportunity and or I would say mandate 
China has a mandate yes. as it yes. being so populous. What are some things that could be learned from these very speaking of history, these recent examples right. of trying to trying to join the big table yes. at that at that capacity? Yeah, you know, um, uh, Japan was really taking over the world. There was a saying of Nihon Ichiban in Japanese, mm-hmm. Japanese meaning uh, uh, Japan number one. At the time, you know, um, Japanese companies were buying into Hollywood. Uh, they were buying into uh, Manhattan, buying you know towers and, and skyscrapers and companies around the world. Toyota was taking over Detroit in a big way, mm-hmm. and suddenly the bubble burst. And uh, people still say, oh, "Why did it really happen?" And maybe it was um, uh, too much of expansion, uh, too much of kind of leveraging. And the Chinese are very much. Um, looking into the Japanese experience, say, how can we avoid it? Right. And uh, what I've seen the last uh, three to four years is that, you know, some of the most active, I would even say aggressive Chinese companies, now were taken back. Companies like uh, Fosun, for example, yeah, companies Wanda. like Wanda, yeah. or even uh, Hainan Airlines, mm-hmm. and they have to sell assets and uh, to kind of um, avoid the Japanese scenario of overexpansion. I think it's a very wise strategy. Uh, of course, it's in a way state capitalism, right, where a state goes in, it wouldn't work maybe in a Western context. Right. But finally, um, I think history is telling the Chinese government that it's the right thing. Uh, of course, China has a very large domestic market, so it's maybe a bit more isolated compared to Japan. Uh, but still, uh, China has to be very careful and, and uh, go only step by step. Also avoid shadow banking, which is another big issue. Um, and uh, to avoid, of course, also the whole area of corruption, which uh, you know was very rampant uh, until recently. Uh, so those are the areas I think um, China should be really carefully looking into. Well, let me ask a question that, of course, you would have to answer with a cloak of anonymity of the people. But you know, in in your work and your consulting, you speak and consult with business leaders, world leaders. Can I ask if you could summarize what are people? At that level, saying to each other and, and to you, what what are you discussing, sort of off the microphone, in terms of where things are? What are the sticking points here in the present day? Like, what's actually sort of the what those of you who are really in the know understand? And of course, then you have to to discuss it at a little bit of a more macro level, right? For for the sake of a conference. But what are what are you actually talking about over over right? Over a yeah, time? yeah. Of course, I don't want to quote people or tell sure. any secrets. Well, that was, I was going to be caveat uh, right, uh, right No, I'll tell right. you uh, actually uh, quite <laughs> rightly what's happening. You know, when yeah. you listen to Western leaders, uh, usually they are still very optimistic. They don't want to scare anybody. But when you talk to them privately, it's different. They're very scared. But they don't have an answer. And that's very scary. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, I think they just don't know how to face, you know, the ARA challenge. They don't really know how to face populism. They don't really know how to face the rise of China. It's a lot of much through. Yeah. And it's really how I would describe the world. It's muddling through. And I think the uh, some of our principled or more principled leaders, they are concerned. They know mm-hmm. about those challenges. They know that we are on the edge. And, you know, we can really quickly, uh, you know, fall off the cliff. Does anyone seem to offer up any good solutions about how to avoid that worst case scenario? You know, I had an interesting um, story. Some some actually leader told me recently that um, some enlightened leaders uh, should collaborate. Uh, let's say maybe uh, Mr. Trudeau in Canada, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Macron in France, and uh, uh, maybe uh, Xi Jinping in China, and said, you know, like a group of concerned leaders, said, you know, let's forget any kind of uh, political background in history. Let's just sit together. And it's not like a formal G8 or G20 meeting, just like, you know, three, four enlightened leaders who collaborate to change the world and said, you know, what are the institutions we need? A very informal group and and, and really try to change course and, and leave all kind of national interests beside. This could be a solution. Well, this is a this is a tricky question. I've been thinking of how to phrase this because I know again you'll be seeing President Xi uh, tomorrow, I believe, if I am understanding your schedule correctly. If you if there was is there one idea if if you if if you had his ear in a one on one context to ask or to suggest if you if, assume that there was that it was politically uh, in the small piece sense assume that it was. Um, appropriate to to speak freely, as they say in the military, permission to speak freely. And you could you could you could 
impart one question, one knowledge, one directive. <laughs> May I ask what you might say? <laughs> yeah, just imagine, you know, sitting with him together and having five minutes. And uh, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I think he's doing uh, many things in the right way. But maybe uh, one channel suggestion is that, you know, the Chinese government um, should try more to put themselves into the shoes of the others. And uh, when it comes to perceptions, and the perception of China in the West is not very good. And I think China could work on those perceptions, could work on, on more like positive mm -hmm. um, uh, perceptions and do everything, you know, to, to change perceptions. And um, it is, it's not soft power, it's something different. Um, it's more saying that, you know, China is a benign global citizen and um, China is trying to contribute to the world, is defending globalization and uh, putting um, global interest um, uh, above national interest. I think this might be something I, I, I could just advise, I think, to any leader in the world, not just to the Chinese, I think to almost everybody, just put yourself into the shoes of, of the others. That already goes to the empathy, the emotional level mm -hmm. that we can resonate. I always say that I had this image in my mind almost all the time, most recently, if, if God, there's a God uh, watching the earth, like from the God or from universe perspective, they see the countries like U.S. and China are suffering in, in, in actual talking to each other or many other countries are really are suffering in being able to talk and communicate with each other. And what, what the facial expression from God would be? Like, are they going to be smelling or, <laughs> or like uh, all concerning or fearfully? You know, those, this kind of thing that I have to come into my mind because we have to really think about from humanity level instead of just from a human level. Because when it comes to we're just a human, you think about you is you and me is me. So that would be a quite different perception from a much more... Um, like vision, a bigger vision. Like a holistic like, view of everything. Yeah, how could leaders develop more holistic views? Mm. Because there's only two ways. Or you drive humanity forward, or you stay, or you know everybody is going right. to suffer. So it's just like, uh, how could this become a consensus that we need to move humanity forward? Right. It's almost a philosophical question, or maybe even a spiritual question, but, a good, but a good question. Yes. Um, first of all, I have to say, talking about God, um, I think um, there's only one God. And uh, even so, you know, we talk about Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other religions. Uh, you know, I think it's all the same. Uh, it's only one God. And, you know, uh, God is, I think, uh, what is behind religion, saying that you should never do anything bad, um, and uh, to anybody else and, and uh, uh, just expect that, you know, the others shouldn't do anything bad to you. And I think that's, that's in a way the principle of, of maybe universal love. And um, I think we should maybe talk about this concept of loving each other uh, and, uh, you know, to be friendly with each other and have, having empathy. Uh, you know, when, when God now would look down and say, you know, how are the humans uh, moving here? Of course, you know, um, God would be concerned, but I think he's always concerned. It's actually his job, right? He has to kind of Where care for people. Like, yeah, like, yeah. like the kids are fighting with each other. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Boys and exactly. Girls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, usually, you know, wars are started by men, right? And uh, not so much by the girls. I've noticed this. This, yeah. is, a, this is a trend. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, I think um, God... Um, uh, uh, will try to kind of stop everything. But of course, he has no direct influence. Uh, so he's watching and, and uh, maybe he's giving, giving like the face and, and the hope to people. And I think face at the end of the day is, has a lot to do with hope, yeah. right? You think you hope for something better and um, maybe something, you know, more long term than just like the short term gain. And I think uh, love and empathy is exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. you, and we talked about altruism before mm -hmm. uh, and we have to care for each other. How do you integrate something as specific and technical as monetary policy with your obvious philosophical take? I mean, I'm sure that the, I think that the one feeds the other, but how, how do you how do you integrate that? You know, it's a very um, complex agenda. We have we have usually um, around. Um, 150 session or global meeting and uh, there are many different topics but there's always one 
channel seam. So this year the theme was um, globalization and its discontent and how to um, generate, create a new uh, version of globalization. Next year will all about, be all about leadership and all sessions actually under this framework of leadership. But um, yes, I think we need the, the ethical uh, dimension. We had actually uh, this year a session led by a philosopher. Mm. His name is uh, Lou Marinoff, based in New York, and um, uh, he was leading a session about love. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it was very interesting. Uh, and uh, with even like, you know, people going to the session saying, you know, it's something a bit more about physical love, right? Mm. Or like, uh, but you know, with actually all aspects, because love, is encompassing everything and um, I think just the caring for each other and this was like the basis but then we talk about monetary policy and coordination saying you know if one country for example is kind of devaluating its currency with like a short-term advantage then the other one will suffer and then maybe we go in a vicious circle mm. so much better to coordinate and when we kind of talk about you know the level of currencies we should always consult each other. So that's what I was getting to is that what's driving the, 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 the setting of the policy, what is actually, you know, is, is it this, this uh, sense of agape or something that's driving the, the, uh, the, the policy, trying to find the way to do the least harm? Yes, to do uh, least harm and um, avoid any kind of uh, tit for tat. Uh, always go for win-win scenario and uh, maybe it's also very Asian principle right mm -hmm. uh, saying there has to be a win-win where everybody is right. uh, taking something out of it that's a negotiating topic yeah. that we talk about yeah on the and show a bit of of course yeah. game theory as well right right yeah yeah well Dr. Richter we really appreciate your time and respect your time let me ask you this what is the best question that we did not ask you what should we have asked you that we didn't <laughs> ask you yet um let me just think about it. It's actually a, a tough one. <laughs> okay. Take a moment. And yeah, if it's a yeah, long yeah. moment, I'll edit it. But if it's a short moment, we'll leave it in. Right. Um, you know, um, one issue is uh, how to uh, take all the good energy, let's say, of people at our summit, for example, or any other gathering into very concrete action and how to uh, create initiatives and uh, to say that we are really using this energy, this um, embassy of people and, and said, you know, we are not just having great ideas and walk away, but uh, really make it happen. Horasis is now working on initiatives, so we have a special program where we follow those initiatives and say, you know, we uh, want to lead on this with smaller working groups in between and then can report back when we meet next time. That's uh, an, our own agenda, and I think that should all of us do in our um, normal life, it's our day-to-day -day life as well, to say that, you know, uh, when we get up in the morning, we, we should say, what can I do to improve mm. things in the world? What can I do, maybe with a little smile, mm. uh, when I talk to my neighbor, when I talk to even like, you know, ordinary people, I see so many leaders or so-called leaders who kind of look down on people, mm. you know, like to taxi drivers, people like at a reception hotel, they're kind of, there's an expression in Chinese, uh, fa pichi, <laughs> get, <laughs> get off your skin, right? You know, who are very kind of, you know, short tempered. And, uh, you know, we should always, you know, treat each other in a nice way. That's why I said you touched the, some of the habit that I practice. I, of course, I wouldn't just go that far. I would say I just ask my one simple question. What is my mission? What I need to do every day to keep my mission, like move forward into helping more people? I mean, it's just simple question. It's, but it's a very different question. Most people actually right now are in blended about because technology, media, everything is so destructive in many, many ways, especially for young people, right? So this is a, kind of my concern that I always talk about in our show that yes, young millennials are like, like myself, like my peers, we are with great dynamics, great energy and great spirit in changing the world. But, you know, we are also young in many, many ways. Our brain, you know, and I feel like we are constantly in an environment that is quite different from the decades ago when it comes to how technology wants to grab our brain, when it comes to putting the information in our brain. And this one of the biggest challenges is this digital uh, culture. Uh, could it be a huge blessing? Could it be a huge um, also disaster for us? 
But that's why I would say、um, that's kind of a practice we need to know ourselves even stronger, you know, deeper to practice asking that question you just mentioned in, in the forum. Maybe drive people to ask this question in a, in a more regular way, and that will little little help, little by little, helping people to keep. Absolutely, that point, I、right? think it's、uh, almost like a great conclusion. And、uh, I <laughs> would say you. that you know,、um, you have to start with ourselves. You know, like self actualization to say, you know, like like、um, saying, you know, how can we develop our Ourself. And of course, you know,、uh, everything digital could be a major distraction.、Uh, digitalization could be very good, but also very bad for mankind. And、um, I think we have to work on the good side. And、um, maybe starting or let's finishing with a, a word of hope.、Um, I wish that.、Um, In ten years' time, the world will be a better place to live on, and we will find solutions. We will avoid war,、uh, real war, or a trade war, or any kind of war, and、uh, we are just good citizens in this world. Dr. Richter, thank you so much for、thank、your time. You、so、thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, that's our show this week. You can visit HowChinaWorksPodcast dot com to learn more about Dr. Richter or any of our previous show guests. Also, feel free to contact us with any feedback or suggestions for future shows. On behalf of my co-host Inging Lee, I'm Brendan Davis, and we'll see you next week on How China Works.